You're listening to BioTalk with Rich Bendis, the only podcast focused on the biohealth capital region. Each episode, we'll talk to leaders in the industry to break down the biggest topics happening today in biohealth. Hi, this is Rich Bendis, president and CEO of BioHealth Innovation, but also host of BioTalk. And we have a great guest for the listeners today. We have Dr. Ann Lindblad, who is the president and CEO of Emma's, who is joining us for the first time, but she's also a member of the BioHealth Innovation Board and a longtime industry member within the Montgomery County and Rockville area. So do you mind if I call you Ann? Please do. Okay, this is Dr. Lindblad, but Ann, from here on out. Very good. Ann, welcome to BioTalk. Thank you very much, Rich. It's a delight to be here. And it's great to have you. And I bet you that there's a lot of listeners who have not heard of Emmis or Dr. Ann Lindblad. So we're going to start with a brief introduction on your bio and background so that we can set the stage for the rest of our interview. Sure. Well, I like to tell stories. So I'm going to tell you a little story about my background. So I've always loved both science and math. And in sixth grade, a very important time in somebody's life growing up, I dissected a frog and I mutilated it. And at that point, I made the important decision I wasn't going to be a physician. So I I kept the math part of my love and continued with it. I had the good fortune to have a fantastic teacher in statistics when I was a senior in high school. And that led me to Holland's College in Roanoke, Virginia, which is actually now Holland's University, that had a major in statistics. And there were few universities at that point that had that major. So I chose the college specifically for the statistics major. And when I was finishing my degree, I really wasn't sure what my next steps were. I still had this love of science. And fortunately, they had a wonderful career office, which I visited, and I first stumbled across the word biostatistics. And I'd never heard that word. I didn't know it existed and that that was a career potential. And just about the same time, I was contacted by the Medical College of Virginia in Richmond about their graduate department in biostatistics. It was very fortuitous. So I went to the medical college and earned a master's degree. I moved to this area and in 1982 joined the MS Corporation as a biostatistician. And I immediately fell in love with the kind of work we were doing because I was using my math skills but learning so much about science. I realized that it was important in this field for me to obtain a higher degree. And so I was fortunate because George Washington University had a night school and they offered a PhD in statistics. So I went to night school and got my PhD in statistics. And I've never left MS, never even thought of leaving MS. And I would just attribute that to I feel like I learn new things every single day. It's rare that anybody spends 36 years with any company. And so tell us what kept you here for 36 years. It's really that the opportunities I've had to learn about science. I've worked with incredible physicians and clinicians across a wide breadth of disease areas. I started in cancer research, spread out to kidney disease, from there went to transplant, dental disease, ophthalmology, traumatic brain injury. So the list goes on. So as I said, I've never stopped learning and I've been mentored by incredible physicians who want to learn about statistics and want to share their knowledge about science with me. And so that way, together, we build really good studies. And so we're sitting here right across from the Rockville Metro, and I'm, we're looking out the window, and we can see this building up the road that says Emma's on us. A lot of people drive by and don't even know what you do. Let's talk about what Emmis does. Great. So I think the best way to learn about Emmis is, again, I'm going to tell a story about its name. So the founder was a statistician, and he went to a lawyer to incorp- make the company a corporation, and he wanted to call it the American Statistical Company. And the lawyer shook his head and said, that's not going to work. You need a two-syllable nonsense word. So the founder was actually a scholar of the Talmud, and he came up with emes, which means truth in Hebrew. And the lawyer was not Jewish, so he did not know what it meant. And to him, it was a two-syllable nonsense word. So he said, there you go. You're going to be great. You have great success. And I think his prediction came true. What was important about the name for our company is that 
as statisticians, our business is to estimate the truth. So when we design studies, we're using statistics to try to estimate what is the true effect of a drug, for example. And so it's a perfect name for, for who we are. And so over, how old is Emma's right now? Right. Emma started in 1977. 77. Right. So we're over 40 years old. And when it started, what were the first products or services that it offered? So we would be considered a contract research organization, which means we help researchers design, execute, analyze, and report on clinical research studies. Uh, They can come in various phases, early phase in drug development or device or epidemiologic studies, anything that is looking to further our knowledge in human health. And so our initial contract was with the National Cancer Institute. They called us a coordinating center, and we did all the same services a CRO would do in executing. It was a program called the Gastrointestinal Tumor Study Group. And so that's how we got our beginning with that very first uh, project. I think it's interesting to note that we continue to work with the National Cancer Institute and have never stopped. That particular program stopped, but we've continued in many other facets with that institute. And we've been able to expand to 13 of the 27 NIH institutes over the history of MS. Well, that's great. When you joined, that was like four years in, I guess. When, and how many people did they have at that time? So when I joined MS, we had, there were 15 employees. We had just merged with another company. So we were seven when I interviewed and jumped to 15, doubled in size uh, in 1982. And, and we've had just incredible fortune to grow in a very steady and consistent manner. So now we are um, at 650 employees. We have offices Our headquarters began in Montgomery County. It remains in Montgomery County. We've expanded our footprint to India, to Canada, to Frederick, and Northern Virginia. And I would imagine you've had to expand because you have a customer base that is global in nature. That's true, whether it's NIH or industry or a foundation. I really think the reason for expansion is our employees. When our employees do good work, they attract more good work. And if we were a company that said, no, we don't want to grow, we just want to stay where we are, then those employees would seek other employment where they could realize their own dreams and ambitions. And so we've made it our mission to make sure we have the infrastructure and flexibility to allow employees who do good work to pursue their passions too. And then I have read that you have basically performed over a thousand clinical trials? I can't count them anymore. Yeah. yeah. Uh, But you know, there's a lot of people listening that probably don't know what a clinical trial involves. Could you give an example to the listeners of what a typical project looks like for Emma's? I know they're very different. It it was a lot easier many years ago. It's much more difficult now. But there, I'll give you a couple bins of projects. One would be a single study. For example, the National Eye Institute undertook a study to look at high-dose vitamins and minerals to slow down the progression to advanced macular degeneration. That was a study that industry wouldn't take on because it was a slow disease. We were looking at very early stages, so it was a 10-year kind of a study. And that's where the National Institutes of Health feel it's important to take on public health issues like that. A lot of people were taking high-dose vitamins for this condition, but there was not enough good evidence to say it was really effective. So they launched this study. So we worked from the very beginning with the institutes, uh, with the, the clinical centers that were part of that study to train them, to unify them on the protocol. We helped write the protocol, of course, in collaboration with the researchers at the National Eye Institute. We developed the data systems, implement them, collected the data, analyzed it, reported. And then the most important thing was publishing the results. And we also, it was under an IND, but it was a high-dose vitamin supplement. So it was never approved as an indication. However, the study was successful. And so, again, great pride. You can go to the local pharmacies here and find and Occuvite Preservation on the shelves, and they've actually done a subsequent study that changed one of the ingredients, so now there's Occuvite Preservation too. And those are things now that can help people's parents or relatives that, that we feel we're, we were an important contributor to. So it's a very broad-based study, and I th- the term I'm hearing today is evidence-based medicine. So it sounds like what you're trying to do is to do the research that comes up with the evidence 
that would enable people to make decisions on the best way to provide service or a product to the consumer. Right. And sometimes it's early stage. So the evidence you're providing is, is there enough evidence to go the next step to do a trial that actually can demonstrate effectiveness? So those are the early phase, phase one and two, where you're looking at the safety of a product or an intervention. And then you're going on, is there potential for efficacy here? And if so, you can use those data and other data to actually design what we call a definitive phase three trial, which could then go for labeling with the FDA if it was success, if the program was successful. So you mentioned also that in addition to the NIH, you might do work for companies or foundations. So talk a little bit about that mix of business and how it differs between an NIH study versus a company versus maybe a foundation study. Right. So foundations, again, tend to have a longer term view in terms of the length of time they're willing to undergo a research program. So they may have a portfolio of studies. They may be looking at malaria in underserved countries. So they have a portfolio of studies that they're supporting to to look at that disease and see if they can make an impact on it across a range of ages. Often with industry, they may have a little more focus on a particular product in a particular population because they're looking to get an indication for that. So there's with many industry clients, there's a very clear start date and there's a very clear end date. They tend not to be 10 years. They may be two or three years. And time is of the essence because they they have a lot invested in these products and getting them to market is important to them. And so as a CRO supporting them, understanding and helping them think about, well, what are the things that might get in your way of your goals? And thinking in terms of the regulatory pathway, that's an area that we can help them with to navigate that for their particular product. And then making sure they have the right sites with the right resources to actually execute the trial in the time frame that they would like to. And I would imagine everything's become so much data-driven today that protecting the integrity and the confidentiality of data is extremely important, especially with all of the people that you come in contact with. So how do you protect all of that research and data that you are compiling? That's a loaded question. <laughs> No, it's it's very it's very complex. You need to protect data at many different levels. There's the company confidential data, but there's also the privacy for the patient and protecting us against outside threats. So the way we've constructed our data systems, uh, we have to make sure we're, for example, FISMA compliant. So there's a lot of rules and regulations, and we get audits to take a look at that uh, to make sure that our systems are as secure as we can make them and meet this, the federal standards and industry standards. Uh, beyond that, it comes into study design. How are you collecting the data? What data are they? If you're collecting patient-reported data, so it may be the patient themselves who are answering a questionnaire, how do you make sure that you can contact them but protect the confidentiality of that contact information? So looking at encryption, at what levels, at what levels can you, if a patient at some time decides they don't want their data in a study, they can pull it or for the future and making sure you have safeguards in place for those sorts of things as well. Thank you. I think the complexity of that is going to continue to get it's much more difficult more. to manage and in the future. For good reasons. For good reasons, for good reasons <laughs> yes. right to protect all of us, right? Exactly, yes. So we're talking with uh, Ann Lindblad, who is the president and CEO of Emmis. And another thing, Ann, after your 36 years, a lot of people are very proud of the culture and the environment that has grown up within the corporation. And you've been ranked one of the best places to work in Washington Post annual ranking. So why do you believe that you get ranked that highly and why would your employees say good things about the company? I believe because we listen and we engage them in conversations about what's important to our employees. So we demonstrate the importance we place in our employees as one of our most important assets by making sure we have the resources they need, the tools they need, so they can focus on the work that they love, which is to provide quality services to the clients. So some of the things that we've 
do and have done over the years is look at their health and wellness. And so we bring in CPR training if people would like to participate in that. We do blood drives. We do health checks. We have a yoga room. We do fitness challenges. How many steps are you walking? So we try to make it fun, but for, we're, we're about improving human health. So that should mean our employees as well. So we want to make sure we're taking care of that. We also do things because people like to give back. We work really hard, but it's, it gives you a great feeling when you can give back to your community. And I think one of the advantages of us being 650 people instead of 15 is there are power in numbers. So now when we do toy drives, coat drives, school supply drives for children and teachers, we get quite a lot of volunteers. We recently joined Leadership Montgomery's Corporate Volunteer Council, and for that, that's just opened up new possibilities because what resonates with me for volunteering may not resonate with another employee. So this gives us many choices to offer our employees so they can give back in ways that are meaningful to them. We try to make it fun for the kids. We have Halloween parties. All the kids come and trick-or-treat. My own kids have outgrown that, but they have fond memories of very large bags of candy. Mm -hmm. And we also have a scholarship that we give out for employees' children once a year for undergraduate and graduate. So it's a $10,000 scholarship that their kids can apply to. So we, we choose from that with an independent committee mm -hmm. every year. That sounds great. Uh, can I come to work for you? Yes, just make sure it's on Friday because we started a tradition of popcorn Fridays. Oh, okay. And, and we continue that okay, tradition. Okay, very good. Too. I love popcorn. <laughs> With growing from 15 to 650 people, though, I would imagine you're constantly recruiting. So, how is it this region for recruiting the talent you need? And what type of talent is it that you're recruiting more of today than you did in the past? This region is excellent for recruiting talent. We have incredible universities nearby within Virginia, Maryland, and DC, and that's important to us. We have a very high number of advanced degree employees, and it's not just in statistics anymore. So the biggest change is that as a full-service CRO, we're looking for really anybody with passion for science who's willing to learn. And there are positions where they do need experience in clinical research, but we also offer opportunities for people who just want to get in the door and learn the ropes of data management or being a clinical research associate to monitor clinics, for example. So I think that's one thing that I'm really happy about being in this community is that we can take somebody fresh out of college, for example, and give them the training and a good start. Sometimes if they were to go to another company, we've had quite a few that then come and return to us. And I think that's because even though we've grown so much, I really believe our mission, our vision, and our values have remained steadfast. And when I get uh, notes from employees uh, telling me how grateful they are for the career opportunities that they've been given and the value we put on the employees, you know, any CEO would be proud of that. So we do have openings. We always have openings. Our turnover rate is lower than industry standard, but it is because we're lucky to be growing and not shrinking. So I encourage anybody out there to look on our website and see if there's a position that may be of interest to them. We can mention it later, but what is the website? emmes.com. Super. We'll repeat it again later. Great. But one of the things you told me you've recently implemented is that you let your employees choose where they want to work. Since we're in a regional environment here and you have offices in Rockville, Frederick and Tyson's, uh, but you also potentially have offered them the ability to work remotely from home at times. So to explain that pol new policy. Right. It It has existed. I think what's new about it is that we now have better tools to support remote workers. We learned early on that if we wanted to retain talent, sometimes life takes them to different states. And when they're good, you don't want to lose them. And so I still am very appreciative for our early adopters of remote working because they had to go the extra mile to stay connected with us. But now we have business Skype, we have chat tools, we have many ways that we can keep in touch. And from a very business selfish perspective, 
if an employee comes to work with a five-minute commute, they have a lot more energy to give than if they've just been sitting in traffic for an hour and a half. And so when we opened Frederick, for example, we had many very relieved employees that were energized that they did not have that horrible commute. They spend more time with their family. And work-life balance is important to us as a company, again, because they'll be more energized for their work. One of the, some of the tips I think we've learned in handling remote offices and employees that now are all over the world is really gets into training. And it's training of our employees that it is different when you're not sitting next to your colleague. You do need to be more proactive in reaching out to make sure that you can ask questions and not just work on a a problem by yourself when you could get help. So again, with things like business Skype, you can share screens. So you can always share and see what each other are working on. And our managers to learn that they don't manage by where somebody's sitting and are they sitting there, but more by productivity. And regardless, I think that's the right philosophy to have because productivity is the name of the game, not just seat time. And so we're really happy that it's worked out this way. We're still learning, but I believe it's a net good for the company and for our employees. In addition to this BioHealth Capital region and the offices you have here, there's been some national and global expansion. Let's talk a little bit about why was there a need to grow outside the region and potentially globally, and what do you see for the future related to future expansion? Right. Well, disease is not contained to the United States of America. <laughs> And so we, again, our mission is to improve human health, and that's around the globe. And so we need to be there where the diseases are and where the needs are. And and we often partner with other companies who have feet on the ground. We find sometimes that's a problem for us, and we would wish that we had our own feet on the ground. And, And I think establishing an office in India has helped us in that area, and the same with Canada. We think the future is we do quite a lot in infectious disease and vaccine research. So Africa is an important place for our staff to be. We were part of the Ebola uh, research working in Sierra Leone. We had staff in Sierra Leone, but they came from the U.S. and went there for training, et cetera, and came back and, and went back and forth. If we actually had presence there, I think it would make us stronger as a company. Same thing in Europe. A lot of ophthalmic studies are being conducted, not just in the U.S., but in Europe. And so having feet on the ground rather than subcontracting that out would make a lot of sense for us. So for our future, I believe it's going to be important to look strategically where our clients need us, where the diseases are, and so what's the most efficient way to do the research. And so we'll be looking at that. And the same thing locally. If we need another office, where's the best place to locate it to, again, help our employees that are not commuting as much and to draw from a bigger talent pool whenever we can. And I would imagine one of the things that will enable you to expand potentially even services or products or offerings or geographically is an event that I saw come over the wire unexpectedly last week. And I was looking at, I forget what I was looking at, LinkedIn or something else. And all of a sudden I saw this announcement of a significant private equity company named Berman Capital, who has made a significant investment into Emma's. So let's talk a little bit about that because this is a major life-changing event you just had last week. So we're thrilled by this development. We chose Behrman because they support our mission, vision, and values, which is really the core of who we are. They chose us because of our incredible world-class talent, our reputation, stellar reputation in the government, and in industry as well. And we think this combination, we'll be able to leverage some of their expertise and relationships so we can continue to build and grow the company in a way that makes sense for the company, again, without losing that important mission, vision, and values. And I guess to differentiate, Beerman is a private equity firm, not a venture capital firm. And there's a difference in the way that people approach their investments when they're doing private equity versus venture capital. So Could you explain how you expect the relationship to unfold with Beerman, with Emma's? So it's important to Beerman that our leadership stays the same. So our leadership is not changing. They're there to help us. And so together, again, using their expertise and their experience, as we look at what we need as leaders, we have this extra support mechanism and ability for further investments so that we can get where we want to go faster than had we done it without their 
uh, investment in us. And, and where do you think that this new access to investment capital will lead Emma's in the future? Right. So there, there are a lot of tools that I think can help our employees and be advantageous to our client. There's a lot of talk, there's been for 10 years, about the use of electronic health records in, in, to facilitate research. And that's an area that we've worked in and we have some solutions, but really to provide the kind of solution we think that is needed for the future, we need some future development in in that sector. So that's one area. The other area is we spoke about previously is foreign footprint. So this gives us an opportunity to look around and be strategic about what would be a good area. And again, using their connections and expertise, maybe make selections of areas that we can start having a presence in that we don't currently. So I think that's really important. At the end of the day, it's back to our employees. If we are successful in this partnership with them and we continue to grow the company, it's just going to give our employees more opportunities for their own personal and professional growth. And then as a result, maybe more products on the shelf, you know, more people helped. And so to me, it's all a win-win. I'm really excited about it. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I think it's great for the company as well as the region. One last question about Beerman is that private equity firms sometimes make significant investments to help grow companies two ways. One is organic growth, to help them grow organically, and the other would be to look at strategic partnering or acquisitions. Do you see that this relationship with Beerman will go in one direction or the other? I think it's going to be a strategic direction. So when it makes sense, they're very strongly supportive of organic growth and how to do that. And that's really one of their emphasis. When they think about and when I think about acquisitions, it's got to make sense. And this is, again, why choosing them as the investor was a good choice for us. They're not doing an acquisition for acquisition's sake. Does it help us get us to where we want to be in terms of a stronger, more varied company that has the diversification that you'd want to survive in, in our continually changing research world? And so that makes good sense to me. And so we'll be working together again to look at what makes sense for the company, just not now, but in five years, what will it look like? And so where should we go? We talked a little bit about the history of Emma's in this region and how it's grown uh, nicely here. Tell me a little bit about what you think about the strengths of this biohealth capital region as we're branding it now over the last three or four years. Uh, and why has it been good and why will it be good in the future for Emma's? Well, as I said earlier, just the proximity to these world-renowned universities. So that gives you an immediate talent pool that not all regions have. So th- having that in this area makes this a very strategic location for us and other companies like us. Having NIH right down the road and FDA, again, these are important institutions that generate much much research themselves, but also help be a catalyst to researchers for some of the biotech industry. So having that client right here, again, why would you be anywhere else? (laughs) And I think what's really important to me and what I've learned working with you over these last few years is... This vision of this capital region being number three by 2023, you know, it could be all words, but in fact, the support you've been able to garner from local government as well as some of the big companies here is really making that a reality. We're already moving up in the ranks and success breeds success. So I think as uh, capital is brought into the region through uh, venture capitalists to help fund some of these startups, having Emmis here so that we're available when somebody's looking for an engaged CRO like us who can actually be a partner with them, then if we're a good fit, we're right in their neighborhood, right down the street from them, and it makes it really easy to interact and help them work with their programs to be successful. So I think this is a perfect place for Emesis headquarters to be. We have no plans to move it because we want to be part of the action. And uh, we really appreciate everything that Biohealth Innovation has done for Emesis and, and helping us be introduced to our neighbors. Great. Well, our brainwashing is working, then. <laughs> so you actually, we have an industry participant who believes that becoming top three by 2023 can really happen. So 
you became CEO in 2013, and that was probably after 30-some years with the company. So congratulations on that. You worked your way up the ranks. But what would you consider the the thing you're most proud about uh, in your 36-year history at Emma's? I think when I see one of our projects with the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development has resulted in six new labelings for kids, it's hard not to be proud of that. I think when we were part of the approval of the very first diagnostic device for diabetic retinopathy using artificial intelligence, what's not to be proud of that? So when I look at those kinds of accomplishments that are moving the needle, those really fire me up and make me very proud. But it's my employees that show up every day that are trying to provide that quality quality service. So if I can read you a quote that from a letter I just received from my client, and again, this gives me great pride. So this client was giving kudos to our team and working on a project with them. And, and she said, I felt Emmis was an extension of our team with shared values and willingness to sacrifice in order to achieve these goals. Emmis listened to our needs, understood the time-sensitive nature, and worked tirelessly to achieve our shared goals. As one who has worked with myriad zeros, I found my experience with Emmis unique and refreshing. And when I get those letters from clients, and I've had similar ones over my history, uh, then it it makes everything worthwhile because I think it embodies who we want to be, how we differentiate ourselves from other CROs. And that's who we plan to be going into the future as well. And so the, you couldn't get that letter coming just to you if you didn't have the employees that believed in the same culture that you're espousing. Exactly. So exactly. congratulations on that culture now, which really, it starts at the bottom and then it raises its way up to the top. For so, sure. Yeah. What is there that we haven't talked about you'd like to talk to the listeners about related to Emmis or yourself personally or the region or anything? I I really just want to put in a final request that if there are any potential employees out there, (laughs) that they do look at our website. We're always looking for great people. And we have many, I think we have 38 openings and we fill them pretty quickly. So hurry up and take a look and get an application in. And, And again, to potential companies out there that may be working on a product and need help and need the services we offer, which again is more of a partner in the research with them. Take a look, look us up. We'd be happy to meet with you again. I see us in this region as neighbors and that gives us an opportunity just to have a chat and see if we're a good fit for each other. And if not, we may be able to recommend other companies who could be. That's great. Uh, We've been visiting with Dr. Ann Lindblad, who is the president and CEO of Emmis, and basically has two requests. Uh, there's 38 job openings if you have interest in coming to work for a growing CRO. Or if you need CRO assistance, there's a website you can go to to find out more. And, Ann, what it's is that again? www.emmes.com. Well, we've enjoyed this chat, and especially with the timing of it, after a major event in Emma's history, of which it's going to propel you into the next generation for your employees, your customers, and yourself. So congratulations on that. Thank you, Rich. I've enjoyed the time with you. Thank you. Uh, We look forward to your continued support and growth within the BioHealth Capital Region. Thank you. Thanks for listening to BioTalk with Rich Bendis. 